what are my feelings when the warden will come get me and take me to the gurney at the Huntsville execution chamber? So I would imagine there'd be a little bit of anxiety, but other than that, it'd probably be a trip. I mean, how many people get to do that? It'll be odd, but uh, scary, I don't think. I mean, what would, be, what would be to be scared of? You know what's gonna happen. Except if they call the last minute and say, no, don't do it, and then you're like, oh, fuck. I gotta do this all over again? Because I've known guys who've done that four or five times and they just never are the same afterwards. This is John Battaglia. At 62 years of age, he has been on death row for almost 16 years. His crime, the deplorable act he carried out on two innocent people. He was convicted and sentenced to death in 2004 after years of numerous appeals were denied, in February 2018, his time had run out. Join us as we uncover the shocking story of John Battaglia. Before we begin, we would like to send our deepest sympathies to the loved ones of Faith and Liberty Battaglia, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. To try and understand death row inmate John Battaglia, you have to go back through his life and the decisions he made that would place him where he landed. And so, we begin. When Mary Jean Pearl met divorcee John Battaglia in 1990, she found him very handsome and charismatic. He was one of those military brats with a family that moved frequently. John's family had moved several times within the U.S. and Europe until his father left the military life in 1970, and they moved to Texas. John himself followed suit after some bad decisions he had made and became a Marine. Eventually, he would leave the service to practice accounting. He would head back to Texas where his father lived, settled in, and became a successful certified public accountant. John had previously been married to a woman named Michelle Getty from 1985 to 1987. It produced one daughter named Christy, but the marriage inevitably failed with divorce following suit. Mary Jean Pearl herself was a very prominent antique dealer within her successful family-owned business. She also managed rental properties. She had come from a wealthy family in Texas. She was an upbeat person with a bubbly, extroverted attitude towards life. After John and Mary Jean met, they dated for a time and then they eventually married on April the 6th of 1991. They lived in a very well-to-do neighborhood in Highland Park, Texas, in an elegant house that Mary Jean's father graciously bought for them. They enjoyed their wealthy lifestyle and the perks that came along with it. Life seemed even more picture-perfect when, in 1992, their first daughter, Mary Faith Battaglia, was born. The next perfect blessing was their second daughter, Liberty May Battaglia, born in 1995. The girls were complete opposites. Faith was a tomboy type, climbing trees and getting dirty. But Liberty was more interested in frilly dresses and tea parties. The girls loved each other dearly and got along well. They also loved their half-sister Christy, and she loved them. John doted on his girls, and of course the girls were absolutely in love with their father. He never spanked the children, and there was never a mean word said to them. You ready for your nap, little ones? John was very charming and giving and fun, and he was just wonderful. Everybody loved John. But there was something troubling, very troubling, inside John. It was brewing and bubbling as it made its way to the surface at unexpected times. John had a darker side, a very dark side. There was a fire deep inside him that he could normally hide. But at times, it would escape and fan into a raging inferno. Mary herself had seen a small flicker of it firsthand on their wedding night. I really noticed it for the first time on our wedding night. He snapped at me about 
about something. And I was like, ooh, you know, that didn't seem quite right. It was the first red flag of warning for Mary Jean, but there had been previous red flags before their marriage that Mary Jean knew about, or at least pieces of it. Um, I did know, he did tell me before we married, that, um, that he had gotten into an argument and, um, and hit his ex-wife. He didn't say I broke her nose. John hadn't told Mary Jean the complete truth about his previous marriage, nor the real injuries he had inflicted on his then-wife, Michelle. Abuse had started when Michelle was pregnant with Christy, and then escalated when they separated in 1986. John physically assaulted Michelle several times. One of those assaults put her into the hospital for days. As time went by, things would begin to change for the worst for Mary Jean. Heated words would escalate into frequent outbursts of the most horrendous verbal abuse from John. Some would last for almost a half an hour at times. Mary Jean would beg him to stop and seek some kind of help from professionals, but that wasn't something he thought he needed. He believed nothing was wrong with him and that it was all Mary Jean's fault. After all, she was a woman, wasn't she? So Mary Jean continued to endure the verbal assaults, her way of accepting what was happening was to just deal with it. If she did, she could keep her family together. That was until one particular incident came close to being a physical assault. Mary Jean couldn't take it anymore. It was time to do something about this nightmare. So in January of 1999, the couple separated and Mary Jean had told John to move out. Nine years of emotional and verbal abuse from John had become too much, and she really hoped he would seek help for his problems. But John Battaglia had many ghosts that haunted him and were never laid to rest. He was raised in an abusive environment by a father who ruled with an iron fist. If a woman got out of line, he knew just how to set them right. John's mother was an alcoholic with several mental disorders, eventually succumbing to suicide in 1972. In 2000, the Battaglia divorce became final. Mary Jean still hoped that John would seek help for his anger issues. He was like a ticking bomb, ready to go off at any time. She was just thankful that he had never cast his wrath against their daughters. Since the divorce, the anger and resentment had slowly burned in John. And one Christmas morning after the divorce, John came to pick up his children for the day. His daughter, Christy, from the previous marriage was with him, and they had planned to go to church. There was an argument between John and Mary Jean, and it soon escalated into a brutal physical assault. In one heated moment, John's anger made him snap. He knocked Mary Jean to the floor. He began kicking her, then repeatedly hitting her on the back of the head. His daughters watched the attack in horror, begging and crying for their father to stop. He finally did, then quickly left the residence, and Mary Jean was able to get to a phone and call 911. John was arrested and charged with misdemeanor assault on Mary Jean. He pled guilty to the charge and was given two years of probation. One stipulation of his probation was absolutely no contact with Mary Jean so he was unable to see his two small daughters for a time. But this didn't stop John from leaving harassing and hateful messages on the answering machine that Mary Jean had placed in the girl's bedroom upstairs. Mary Jean, in turn, reported the harassment to the police and also to John's probation officer. Due to John violating his probation, a warrant for his arrest was issued on May 2, 2001, and he was advised he needed to turn himself in. He agreed that he would, but wanted to have one more evening with his two daughters, and then he would come to the police station. It was a mistake to have allowed him this one request. That evening, John would have his regular visit with his two daughters, and they would go out to dinner. So Mary Jean met him at their designated spot, and John picked the girls up. She had no idea what was about to happen. After Mary Jean had driven out of sight, instead of going to dinner, John headed towards his residence at the Adam Hatz Lofts where he lived. 
Mary Jean had gone through hell and was still going through it. The one thing that she hated the most was taking the girls to John. She knew how the girls felt about going for their visits. Liberty would even hide under the bed, but Mary Jean was ordered by the courts to comply. They had begged their mom not, not to make them go, and she could not defy the court order because it was a court-ordered visitation. The girl's mom was so terrified of him that she met and did the exchange of the girls, I believe, in a public parking lot. Uh, and then delivered them to her, to John, um, and they got in the car and went to the back window. and. Um, I can't imagine this is mom. <laughs> but the last thing she saw was the girls just with their face plastered up against the window, waving goodbye to her in that parking lot. Mary Jean had been planning on going to a meeting, but decided that she wanted to spend a little time with Melissa, a friend of hers. When she arrived at Melissa's, her friend told her she needed to call her mother about something. She made the call, found out that the girls wanted her to call them, so Mary Jean called John's number. He picked up the phone and placed it on speaker. The next voice Mary Jean heard was Faith, asking her mother why she wanted to put their daddy away in jail. And then the call turned into utter horror. I said, hi. Hi, John. My mom called and said that the kids want to ask me something. And he said, girls? And Faith goes, mommy, why do you want daddy to have to go to jail? I go, no, John, don't do this. And then I hear Faith going, no, daddy, please, daddy, don't do it. Daddy, please don't do it. And I hear him yell, Mary, Christmas. Mary Jean was so upset that her friend Melissa had to dial 911 and then hand the phone over to her. When the police arrived on the scene, they made a swift entry into the apartment due to the circumstances, and they simply could not believe what lay before them. Nine-year-old Faith was located near the phone in the kitchen, and six-year-old Liberty was closer to the front door. Both girls were beyond help. Officers went through the whole apartment, but John was nowhere to be found. He made a phone call, locked up the apartment, and just left the girls there. He had shot them both with a, in the torso with a, a little pistol that he had. And then once they were down, he put a Glock 9mm to the back of their head and pulled the trigger, and that was a case of severe, severe blood loss. Sometime after 1 a.m., John was spotted outside of a local tattoo parlor, standing beside his black extended cab truck. He had just been inside getting two rose tattoos on his arm, meant to symbolize his two daughters that he had just murdered in cold blood. John produced an attitude and was refusing to go with the officers, violently resisting arrest. It had taken four of them to detain, handcuff, and place him in the back seat of a patrol car. The final blow to Mary Jean came when she arrived home after the horror of that night. She checked the answering machine up in the girl's room and found a message there. It was a phone call John had made just before he had left his apartment and after he had killed the children. On April the 2nd, 2002, John Battaglia's murder trial began. One person that would testify was his former wife, Michelle Getty, who spent several hours on the stand. She wanted to make it clear that there was no doubt about what kind of a person John was or what he was capable of. On April the 23rd, 2002, the jury was handed the case. They deliberated for just 19 minutes. 
they convicted John of capital murder in the death of his daughters. John Battaglia searched for familiar faces in court today, someone who knows him better than anyone. I miss my grandkids. I, mean, I miss them all. But he's still my son. He is John Battaglia as well, the convicted murderer's father. The son's death sentence comes from the 2001 murders of his own children. Battaglia shot Faith and Liberty, his nine and six year old daughters, while his ex wife listened on the phone. A court order stopped his planned execution last March. This court hearing examines Battaglia's mental competency. Is he fit for execution? Next would come the sentencing, life without parole or the death penalty. His lawyers argued that he shouldn't get the death penalty due to his bipolar disorder. But on April the 30th, 2002, he was sentenced to death. For anyone sentenced to death, it goes to a direct automatic appeal. And his lawyers worked to have his death sentence commuted to life. But in 2005, the conviction and sentence stood. His execution date was set for March the 30th, 2016. John Battaglia went through numerous appeals all the way to the Supreme Court, stays of execution, and a series of competency hearings and evaluations by four experts. The execution of John would finally go through. His death warrant was signed for October the 13th, 2017, and a new date for his execution was set for February the 1st of 2018. Battaglia's execution has been halted twice before on claims he was not mentally competent. The prosecutor who tried his case says Battaglia, a former accountant with a master's degree, is anything but incompetent. We provided him a fair trial. There was a fair jury. They, they rendered the appropriate uh, verdict. And now there's been, you know, years of appeal. He's been vetted so much. He's had so many uh, uh, chances. Uh, but now it's, it, 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 it's time to close this out. He just needs to go. Mary Jean Pearl, the mother of those two little girls, was in attendance tonight in Huntsville to witness that execution. Reporting live from Deep Allen, Marianne Martinez, CBS 11 News. 16 years after he was sentenced, he would die by lethal injection. During his 2002 trial, three defense psychiatrists testified that Battaglia had bipolar disorder. His surviving daughter from his first marriage told the Dallas Morning News in 2014 that her father was also diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder characterized by an inflated sense of self-importance, a deep need for admiration, and a lack of empathy. John Battaglia felt he was the victim here. John had several interviews while he was on death row, which in turn stroked his ego and fed his narcissistic side. He spoke about his first wife, Michelle, and about assaulting her for the first time. He even laughed and blamed her for the assault. Her injuries were horrendous. Oh, when I, when I attacked Michelle, uh, I wouldn't really call it attack. Went up to her when she was walking down the sidewalk and I said, you're, uh, you're going to have to learn this lesson. And I just held her by the shoulder and I popped her in the head twice. And, you know, she moved her head the wrong way and I snapped her nose. The first blow that he hit me w was in my eye. And it was like I felt my eye hit the back of my head and come forward. And, but then he hit my nose, which broke my nose. The bone punched through right here. And she fell down and I just walked away. She said I struck her about 20 times, but she was unconscious before she hit the ground. And then my jaw, which dislocated my jaw. Um, and then I had a, like a big bruise here. And as I fell, he just kept hitting. And once I hit the ground, then he just started kicking. Well, the fact that she got me put in prison, <laughs> she, she knows that, that uh, the bullshit she pulled, the only way to keep from sending her front teeth flying out her asshole is to have me behind this glass. Then, when he spoke about Mary Jean, he blamed her for any misfortune that had occurred to her or the family. But his eldest daughter knew the real truth about her father. So when Mary Jean filed for divorce, I knew she was going to betray me, and that betrayal would probably lead to all of our deaths. So I went and got their names. I mean, everything was 
very well hidden from me until that Christmas when he beat up Mary Jean in front of me. That I knew any part of that. I mean, he had never laid a hand on me. He rarely even yelled at me. John talks about his daughters as though they would be going to get ice cream at the end of the day and such fond memories of them as if he did not have a hand in their death. Do I think I was a good father to liberty and faith? Yes, I, I mean, you know, I tried to be. Faith was a tomboy. She played soccer, you know, didn't want to wear a dress. Now, Liberty was in princess costume almost every day. Oh, gosh. Oh, my fondest memory of my daughters. Uh, well, I have another daughter. She's 30 now, Christy. When, uh, when we used to all get together and go somewhere, it was a kind of a little bit of a three ring circus, if you can imagine. Three highly energetic, fun little girls just having a great time. When John was asked about his execution date, he appeared jovial as if he were speaking to someone over coffee, not talking about his upcoming death. He didn't even seem to be phased by it. Oh, what are my feelings towards my uh, execution day? Um, yeah, it's two weeks. Today, uh, Wednesday, today's Wednesday, so it'll be um, on Wednesday the 30th. You know, it's a way to get out of here. The thought of him being executed upsets me. For 15 years, I have prayed that he would die in prison from anything before an execution date was ever set. Would I say I'm ready to be executed? I mean, I don't want to be, because especially now that I'm speaking to my daughter, I like that. But, um, I mean, as far as like mentally prepared, yeah, I mean, it's not gonna be that big deal. I mean, it's better than getting snuck up by somebody and shot in the back or killed in a car crash and, you know, chopped up the hamburger meat or dying in some stupid son of a bitch's war in some place. So, I mean, of all the possibilities, it's not that bad. It's very clean and they're very nice to you, considering. John talks about his daughters, but appears as if he isn't part of the murders of his daughters. There really doesn't seem to be any emotion there at all. Yeah, the charge is capital murder, and uh, for my two daughters, Faith and Liberty, in uh, 2001. When he's asked about the last statement he would give, John was flippant about it cruel towards Mary Jean and accusatory towards others that might be at his execution. The whole time, his eldest daughter still struggles to deal with it all. I've always, now, once it happens, it's done. This, it's the final chapter of the story. Maybe I can finally move on, not be the girl whose dad is on death row. Oh, have I thought about my last statement? Yeah, I've run a, I've run a couple different ones by. You know, uh, I thought of uh, Soylent Green as people, you know, and then bring an image of Charlton Heston in and say, hang on to your Second Amendment rights, vote for Trump, um, you know, uh, say something derogatory about my poor ex-wife, tell my daughter I love her. Um, but I'm not having any witnesses there, so I'm not really concerned about it. You know, there's going to be a couple little cocksuckers from the DA's office who I could give a shit about. You know, they enjoy that because they have small penises and, and, and smaller egos, so watching somebody else be killed because they're not man enough to do it themselves? What do I, what do I care about those little piss ants? John talks about his final moments and what it may be like in the execution chamber. He does this as if it's the most natural thing in the world, not talking about his own death. What are my feelings when the warden will come get me and take me to the gurney at the Huntsville execution chamber? So I would imagine there'd be a little bit of anxiety, 
But other than that, it'd probably be a trip. I mean, how many people get to do that? It'll be odd, but uh, scary, I don't think. I mean, what would, be, what would be to be scared of? You know what's gonna happen. On February 1st, 2018, John Battaglia was strapped down to the gurney that stood in the execution chamber. An IV was placed in his arm, the lethal dose waiting. John was very animated, as if he were the man of the hour at a going away party. He even wanted to know how many people would be present at his send-off. On the victim's side, there sat Mary Jean. On John's side, not one single person was there. He spotted his ex-wife and managed to get in one last jab. Well, hi, Mary Jean. I'll see you later. Bye. He then told the warden, go ahead, please. By just injecting pentobarbital, the current method will cause a person's central nervous system to shut down in a manner similar to other barbiturate overdoses. When the warden gives the go-ahead, the IV catheter is opened and the fatal dose of pentobarbital will flow towards its target. Once it has entered the system, it should do its work in about five minutes. John lifted his head and looked at the chaplain at one point. Am I still alive? He then grinned and sighed. Oh, here, I feel it, he said. He smiled and closed his eyes. He'd been given a lethal dose of the barbiturate pentobarbital used in Texas executions. Currently, in the state of Texas, they only use this method. Until 2009, the three-dose cocktail was used in most states. Midazolam for sedation, Pavulon, which causes muscle paralysis and respiratory arrest, and potassium chloride to stop the heart. If done right, it will bring about a rapid death. John Battaglia's pentobarbital brought death to him in 22 minutes at 9.40 p.m. Mary Jean had watched for a time before moving to the back of the room, but at the very end, she moved back to the glass to watch the doctor examining John. She wanted to confirm that that monster was gone. John Battaglia wasn't meant to be a husband or a father. His demons were too great, and he refused to seek help to rid himself of the evil that thrived inside him. John will only be remembered for the pain, destruction, and death he caused. No memorials will be placed in his honor. He didn't receive a family burial at a well-known cemetery. He was cremated, and it's unknown where his ashes are. Faith and liberty lost their innocent lives by the hand of a man who was meant to protect them. He failed them miserably. And he failed his eldest daughter, Christy, robbing her of a life with her half-sisters and watching them grow up. Mary Jean left the girls' room just as it had been. She drifts in there every now and then, sitting, listening to the silence, longing to have her two babies back in her arms. Children are a gift to us to be loved and always cherished. Thank you for watching. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below with your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. On your way out, don't forget to hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadow. Just a warning, the following story has some difficult subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised.